I now invite Dr. Ajanta Sen, co-chair for the conference and director Solar Project India, to chair the Professor R. K. Soshi Memorial keynote address. One, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Shweta. We stand at a momentous point of history as mankind struggles to stay afloat against a global pandemic. Through this, in our own humble way, we endeavor to infuse hope, a hope to survive, a hope to do new things. And therefore, at the opening of the 14th edition of Pedagogy Day, uh, we herald the idea of hope. We also realize that it is the time to pay a debt of gratitude to our mentors as we acknowledge that we all stand on the shoulders of giants. It is this realization that makes us open every type of day with the Professor R.K. Joshi Memorial Lecture. Professor R.K. Joshi, known to the world of typography and calligraphy as designer, artist, teacher, poet, para excellence, group and type design. Three years of working professionally uh, with multilingual communications as part of the Indian advertising industry. We were fortunate to have Professor Joshi serve for six years as faculty member at the Industrial Design Center at IIT Bombay, where he was able to initiate research projects in promoting Indian languages and script in the field of design. He managed to influence a whole generation of students who went on to work significantly for publications such as the Malayalam Manorama, the Anand Bazar Patrika, the Times of India, and many more. When Professor Joshi came in, he all, uh, which people remember to this day, uh, he also organized uh, a fantastic event, the Akara Ex International Exposition of Calligraphy, which was, uh, we understand, attended by Gorbachev and uh, Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, Professor Joshi's last address, uh, significant address, was at the Ecobrada Design Week, uh, where he was uh, uh, given a commendation of Grandmaster's Award. And uh, his lecture uh, drove a full house to standing ovation. Uh, in no small measure, Professor Joshi, uh, as visiting type design specialist at the National Center for Software Technology, the NCST, uh, uh, created seminal amount of work in the area of language technology and type design. And finally, what remains etched in people's minds was his vivid, colorful personality that has happily spawned generations of students to lovingly mimic his passionate manner of speaking. There can be no greater tribute, no loving, more loving tribute than this from student to teacher. We therefore start Typography 21 with the theme of hope and with the RK Joshi Memorial talk an honor that goes to Professor Mohanty. Professor Mohanty was a professor of English and head of the Institute of Applied Sciences and Humanities at the GLA University at Mathura. There are several hats, uh, but because we know this is not, this does not merely reflect his seminal role in the preservation of indigenous languages, endangered languages. Firstly, as a current principal investigator of projects on endangered languages under the scheme for protection and preservation of endangered languages at the Central Institute of Indian Languages, Mysore, as a project supported by the Ministry of uh, uh, Education. Uh, secondly, Professor Mohanty has served as member of the executive body of foundation for uh, as member of executive body of foundation for endangered languages, UK in UK's own effort at a round table for uh, protection and preservation of indigenous traditional knowledge and endangered languages. And if UK not necessarily known for indigenous languages can become so aware of this initiative, then India can't be that far behind India as global capital of uh, indigenous languages. Uh, we need to uh, recognize Professor Monty's uh, support and tireless effort in this regard by delving into areas which are scarcely known, areas such, such as 
psycholinguistics, social linguistics, ethnolinguistics, computational linguistics, quantitative linguistics, uh, publishing works, phenomenal prolific amount of work, uh, which, which counts for at least 43 of them across the last 10 years. Uh, we understand that, uh, that he has used these areas to understand the nuances of vanishing indigenous languages. And we take this as a cue for typography itself to engage in areas such as this in order to be meaningful in the years ahead. Professor Mohanty's talk today, followed by our Australian keynote speaker from tomorrow, forms the crux of our initiative for UNESCO's declaration of 22 to 32 as the global decade for indigenous languages. Without further ado, we warmly welcome Professor Mohanty to kindly deliver the introductory keynote address. Over to you, Professor Mohanty. Namaskar. So thank you very much. Uh, Professor Uweya and Dr. Sen, uh, Professor Fani Tetali. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some of uh, my ideas with the colleagues um, who are from India as well as from abroad. The title of my talk is Diversity in Language and Environment, a Design of Hope. Initially, I thought I should talk about diversity in language and culture. But then, you know, because we don't much, uh, you know, discuss language and culture uh, when we compare these two environments. So I thought it will be a little more uh, attractive and draw the, it will certainly draw the attention of the participants and others if I talk about environment. There's the reason for which I've, I've done that. Uh, it was Charles F. Hockett who way back in 1958, uh, he was teaching at Cornell University in the United States of America. He talked about the design features of language. He talked about many features, but I have taken only four of them here. Arbitrariness uh, means um, the uh, spoken word or the written word has nothing to do, no causal connection with the referent. For example, if you talk about a tree, um, uh, it will be tree in uh, English, it will be paid in Hindi, it will be maram in Tamil, it will be uh, gach in Bangla, etc, etc. So you can see that there is no connection between the object tree and these words. That's why the relationship between language and the um, environment or the referents is arbitrary. Displacement means uh, in language we can talk about the past, we can talk about the future also. And it's possible only in the human language. No subhuman animal can talk about the future or they cannot recall what happened in the remote past, though they can do some kind of recalling, but they cannot uh, do it like human beings. Prevarication means, you know, telling lies in a very simple language. Only human beings tell lies uh, in language. No animal can do that. Whenever any animal does such a thing, it's for saving its life, not for end. But human beings do it just like that. Learnability is human beings are learnable. For example, I speak Odia at home, but you know now I'm speaking English. So human languages can be learned by other human beings, whereas you know, the animals cannot learn um, uh, another uh, language. When we talk about language, there are three major components um, in it. One is phonology, which deals with sounds and arrangement of pronunciation, articulation of sounds and arrangement of sounds. Then there is grammar, which deals with word structure and sentence structure. And the most important for me today is lexicon, because we, uh, when we talk about lexicon, we talk about the words. And words live in families, as human beings live in families. I'm using words, they live deliberately for the, you know, uh, for referring to words. Words also live in families. Words have their relationships. So for example, antonymy, synonymy, antonyms, synonyms, Holonyms, meronyms, etc., hyponyms, hyperonyms, you know, you talk about this thing. And they, they have a relationship also. And that relationship is 
paradigmatic and syntagmatic relationship paradigmatic relationship to be uh, say in a very simple um, language will be you know when uh, we wear dresses first we wear a banyan then a shirt then a coat not uh, in the reverse order so it is what is called syntagmatic relationship but we can have a paradigmatic relationship in instead of a shirt i can wear a t-shirt instead of a coat i can wear a uh, sweater so this is what is so uh, a, a, a shirt a t-shirt etc all these things are in a paradigmatic relationship because they um, create a paradigm which can be replaced you know uh, by each other then uh, it uh, you know when you are talking about languages there is intra and inter language relationship because uh, we have uh, you know because india has been a, um, i mean what's a paradise of languages for millennia there are umpteen number of languages there are maybe odia has many dialects telugu has many dialects bangla has many dialects english has and all these languages have many dialects this is called internal relationship but what i emphasize today is the external relationship or inter language relation that we have i'll give a few example um since i'm an odia speaker and this is a very typical characteristic of odia with reference to the verbs you can see that in odia you know for we will eat we have two equivalents um such as ame khai bu ame khai ba but if you take other languages for example hindi or english uh, hindi or let's say bangla or uh, ohmia or marathi you will have to say you know uh, in hindi hum khayenge there cannot be anything else but here ame khai bu ame khai ba and when i say ame khai bu it means the hearer is not in, included in the activity of eating if i tell somebody that ame khai bu that hearer must leave that place immediately that means you are not invited if i say ame khai ba it means you are invited you should be there and i can show that you know uh, all dravidian languages do that and uh, odia does it in the verb but other dravidian languages do it in the you know subject uh, for example in telugu it is memu tintamu memu tintamu means if i say memu tintamu the hearer must leave he is not in or she is not invited if i say manumu tintamu then yes the hearer is also included um, you know in ui so here in telugu and other dravidian languages other south indian languages uh, you know the the uh, difference is uh, they are in the pronoun memu and manamu for example in telugu but pronominal system is a very rigid system which re is resistant to change so when odia acquired this feature from the dravidian languages what it did since pronominal system is a rigid system it made some you know innovation in the verbs why i'm saying pronominal system is a rigid system uh, the best example is that pronouns are hardly borrowed all of us say you know you speak english but we never use i or you or we while speaking our languages i you know i have never heard anybody saying uh, you kal ghar jaoge kya will you go home never never so you know pronouns are hardly borrowed a similar thing has happened uh, in other languages also let me give an example from bangla ram ashbe bole ami jani uh, here you know uh, the english um, equivalent is i know that ram uh, will come so ram ashbe bole ami jani and i can literally you know translate that word for word translation can uh, take place uh, um, to telugu రాముడు వస్తాడు అని నాకు తెలుసు సి రామ్ రాముడు ఆస్బే వస్తాడు బోలే అని ఆమి జాని నాకు తెలుసు దేర్ ఇస్ ఎ లిటిల్ డిఫరెన్స్ ఐ వాంట్ డిస్కస్ దాట్ బికాస్ దట్స్ ఎ డెటివ్ కన్స్ట్రక్షన్ నాకు తెలుసు వెన్ ఇట్ ఇన్ ఇన్ బంగ్లా ఇట్ ఈస్ ఇట్స్ ఇట్స్ నాట్ ఎన్ డెటివ్ కన్స్ట్రక్షన్ బట్ యూ కెన్ సీ దట్ వాట్ ఫర్ వాట్ ట్రాన్స్లేషన్ ఇస్ పాసిబుల్ సో వీ హ్యావ్ ఎ వెరీ గుడ్ రిలేషన్షిప్ ఇంట్రా లాంగ్వేజ్ రిలేషన్షిప్ ఇన్ దిస్ కంట్రీ and what i'm trying to say is that when i say that uh, when i'm showing the relationship between odia and telugu or bangla telugu i am not saying that odia and bangla have converged with uh, telugu no there are umpteen number of tribal minor uh, you know tribal dravidian languages spoken 
in Odisha, Bangla, uh, you know, uh, in many other states. So we have converged, we have given, we have taken from these languages. For this reason, uh, um, MB MNO in 1956 said that India is a linguistic area. And then it was Prabodh Vecharadas Pandit, uh, who was a Deccan College Pune, then shifted to Delhi University. He uh, talked about India as a social linguistic area because he said that not only at the linguistic level, that is at the level of phonology, uh, morphology, uh, and you know vocabulary, at, at the social linguistic level, at a societal level also, uh, with reference to languages, uh, there are convergence features. Then it was my guru, Professor Shishir Kumar Das, who talked about literary area. He has not published on that, but you know he has left certain things with me and I'm sure I'll be publishing it very soon. And taking a clue from that, you know, way back in 93, I uh, claimed that India is a translation area also. If you translate from one language, in one Indian language to another, it is much easier than when we translate from English to an Indian language or vice versa. And this paper was of course presented in, a, uh, in an international seminar in 2018. I, in the beginning, I said that you know lexicon is quite important from uh, the uh, you know from the uh, cultural point of view. Lexicon it is the carrier of most of most load uh, of a language in terms of its volume, because uh, uh, as we know, a phonological description, a description of phonology or grammar that is morphology and syntax can be done uh, within a few you know, pages, even maybe 100, 200, 300 pages. But if we look at a dictionary, it's always voluminous because dictionary, uh, when you talk about lexicon, it represents the culture, the society. That is why it's voluminous. And I'll give you a very interesting example here and how, you know, through lexicon, we can even reconstruct whatever a history of a language and the society, of course, if you look at the names of animals and uh, the, their flesh or meat in English, it's a very interesting difference. Uh, the animal name is sheep, uh, but you know, uh, its flesh is mutton. Cow, beef. Calf, veal. Pig, pork. Deer, venison. Uh, there is a spelling mistake. It should be venison, S-O-N. Um, and you can see that the animal names are English, whereas the, their meat or flesh is uh, French. It's because those days when the French um, were ruling uh, over uh, England those days, uh, they used to uh, consume the meat and the animals were raised by the English speakers. That is, I know that shows that once upon a time, uh, the French were consuming the meat and the animals were being raised by the uh, English speaker. That is uh, the reason for which animal uh, names are English, whereas the, uh, uh, the names of uh, uh, different kinds of meat uh, uh, are uh, French. Here I would talk about the very famous sapir whorf hypothesis, who uh, argued that, uh, you know, it's also otherwise known as the uh, theory of re linguistic relativity. I don't talk about linguistic determinism because it's a very strong version and I don't believe in strong versions uh, when it is, uh, we are talking about social sciences. So let's talk about the theory of relativity. It's much better linguistic uh, relativity, not linguistic determinism. It was Edward Sapir and his student, Benjamin Lee Worth, who was a fire engineer, uh, Sapir was a linguist. And these two people could uh, emphatically show that language uh, influences thought. The example that I'll give the example, uh, um, what uh, Worth has given, there was a, uh, or there was, there are fire accidents um, uh, in the United States of America where uh, Worf was living. And Worf uh, was a little uh, disturbed because why so many fire accidents were taking place. So what he did is that, so he wanted to visit that place and went from house to house. He visited quite a number of houses and he could see that, oh, people were not at all careful while using the gas cylinder. It's because gas cylinder was known as 
an empty cylinder. That is the reason because it was empty cylinder, people thought it was empty and that's why they were not very careful. So that's why we claim that, well, there is an influence of language, you know, that is the reason for which, you know, uh, were um, hypothesized that language influences thought because the name empty cylinder gave an impression to the users that, you know, it was empty for which they were, uh, they were not at all careful about that. And, uh, you know, that's why um, vocabulary is quite important in any, um, let's say, um, uh, linguistic study or in any society. And because it not only reflects the culture, but also influences uh, our thought processes. If we, and, but unfortunately, vocabulary uh, is the most unstable and fragile component of a, any language. Because, um, you know, if we can uh, look at uh, the change in English vocabulary, vocabulary since 10th century, uh, we'll see that uh, it, it's sea change. A lot of change, uh, changes have taken place. But if you look at the grammar, changes in grammar, some changes have definitely taken place, but the grammatical changes are not really so, you know, phenomenal or uh, uh, not really great. And again, if you look at a 10 year old child's competence in um, uh, her language, we'll see that a 10 year old child is fully competent to uh, use the phonology and grammar of her language. Whereas her vocabulary is certainly uh, uh, very limited because uh, the um, 10 year old child won't be able to understand many vocabulary items or cannot use many vocabulary items. Professor Franz Boas was a physicist by training and his PhD thesis was on physics. So, but you know, he became an anthropologist and he would be remembered for eternity in, you know, anthropology. And he was working on the borderline of linguistics and uh, anthropology or language and culture. So he proposed the concept of cultural relativism. I'm linking it to the theory of, uh, you know, linguistic relativity of, uh, you know, Edward Sapir and uh, Benjamin Lehorf. And Boas concept of cultural relativism, relativism is as radical and unique as the concept of, you know, theory of relativity uh, by Einstein in physics. Is that, is that important? But unfortunately, in our studies, we never talk about, uh, you know, linguistic relativity and cultural relativism in social sciences. And uh, I emphasize again, cultural relativism of Boas is as important and as radical, as unique as Einstein's theory of relativity. You have Tadva words, uh, which are actually derived from Sanskrit. Uh, it's not like Sanskrit. There are some, you know, changes, phonological changes, because that's why it's a Tadbhava. Tadbhava means, you know, derived from that or burned from that. Then we, we have Vaideshika or foreign, and there are Deshaja or Deshya or native. But this is not a very, uh, what should I say, appreciable classification. There are issues. That's why, you know, I don't like uh, uh, this classification, but I won't discuss that. I will primarily emphasize the category of uh, deshaja or native words. These words are highly misunderstood and neglected. When somebody said native, what does it, it mean? doesn't mean anything because India is a country of cultures, traditions, and languages. And those things are quite important for us. And we, when we say deshaja, does, uh, you must be specific about where from the word comes or what is the source of a word that is not done in you know, most of our studies. And a large chunk of vocabulary is depleted with the loss of the traditional crafts and professions. It has happened. I have seen in my you know, native place, which used to be a village earlier, there were you know, many traditional craft doing people, people were performing many professions, but now they are not at all doing that. When I got married, I could see you know, how the we dress for me, which, which I had to wear, and the carpenter, what he did for, or, you know, all the, the, these crafts are not there at all. They have vanished. And with these crafts, whatever words were being used, they have also vanished. And our vocabulary, our language has become, I should say, poorer by this.
and you know these native words represent not only the local culture but also the environment for example if you take the names of the flora and fauna and we use forget about the flowers such as rose and other things you know which everybody will probably understand in this country if you take some other names most names are not shared by all the languages they are different take the names of uh, you know uh, let's say fish and in uh, believe me in odisha uh, uh, because i come from northern, northern odisha the names of different kinds of fish when i use um, you know um, uh, let's say before the people who come from the so called standard speaking odia they don't understand the same thing is true of the names of certain animals they are very different so and keeping this in view uh, unesco uh, uh, very loudly and uh, emphatically said that conservation of biodiversity crucially depends on maintenance of indigenous languages and i conducted an experiment long ago when i asked to deliver a talk somewhere else and what i did is that i uh, requested 15 of uh, uh, our students uh, from the university of hyderabad right from phd in physics to um um integrated ma masters uh, students in let's say linguistics to work with me i took them to a place where you know it was an open kind of space i said i want uh, you know you people to advise me how to convert it into a kind of let's say uh, garden and everybody told me that well um, there were two big trees huge trees everybody right from you know uh, that uh, those physics students to linguistics students everybody told me that let's cut these tree uh, two trees then i asked them do you know the names of these trees they said no if you don't know the names of uh, those trees obviously they are not important for us because i don't know uh, what it means or what its use uh, is and that is why and we know the names of the trees uh plants animals birds in our mother tongues very well i have uh, seen that uh, whenever i ask my students post graduate students at university of hyderabad when i ask them to name let's say 10 names of birds in uh, english they would uh, you know uh, fumble uh, you know they would uh, take a pause they would all sorts of things but whenever i ask them to tell me the names of uh, 10 birds in their uh, mother tongues they won't take time at all they, they will take in a few seconds they would name the 10 ten, 10 ten names so mother tongue is very important for this purpose because if the mother tongues are conserved then they will uh, try to conserve the environment also biodiversity also if the mother tongue is depleted obviously the uh, environment becomes an undifferentiated mass for those people and here i must tell you that people most people more why most people almost every indian believes that india is a multilingual country india is not a multilingual country because india metaphorically is a multilingual country because there are india india speaks many languages but the indians do not speak many languages because the uh, uh, right from 1991 we are getting the bilingual and trilingual figures um, um in india thanks to the census of india reports and you can see that it is you know uh, diminishing every uh, in every decade and this is the 1921 and now we are going to have the um um let's say uh, census and i'll give you the statistics here india uh, you know no first let me talk about uh, the um, national average of bilinguals the national average of bilinguals is 26.01% and the national average of trilinguals is 7.10% and can anybody say that india is a multilingual country and these are the data given to us by the census of india and that is the only dependable census in this country you know there may be issues i don't say that it is uh, let's say trilinguals are 7.10% it may be a little more or less that's a different thing but it cannot be completely ignored 
And if you compare this with 2001 census uh, figures, you will see that you know the bilingual figures are 42.30, and the trilingual figures are 17.37. And if you compare that with 2011, see it, it is you know 26.01 and 7.10. Then let's look at the uh, language situation in this country. India has four major language families, not only language for only four language families, four major language families, Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, Austro-Asiatic, and Tibeto-Burmese, according to census, but we use it Tibeto-Burman. Anyway, that's not an important thing. The number of languages spoken uh, belonging to Indo-Aryan uh, family uh, is um, 21. 21 languages, and the percent of, percentage of speakers are 78.05. Come to Dravidian, it is 19.64. So you can say that, you know, almost 78% uh, uh, and 20%. So totally, if you look at 98% of the, you know, Indian languages belong to these two families, Indo-Aryan and Dravidian family. And Austro-Asiatic family ha has 14 languages and the Percentage of speakers is 1.11. Tibetan Burmese is 66. Now you can see the precarious condition of the languages in India. If you, you know, we tell uh, the number of Indo Aryan, Dravidian, Austro Asiatic languages, they are not 66. Only Tibetan Burman language or Tibetan Burmese languages are there 66, but the speakers are only 1%. So, you know, you can see the kind of distribution of languages in our country. And unless we are careful and um, by chance something happens, God forbidding something happens to these Austro-Asiatic and Tibetan speakers, you know, two families will vanish. And how many languages will be? 80 languages will vanish from earth. You know, this is where we became conscious and start thinking about it, especially when UNESCO is going to celebrate, you know, from 2022 to 2032 as the decade of indigenous languages. And I'll um, um, give also the data from the whole world. The whole uh, the world scenario is not very encouraging or rosy also. Ethnologue, it's 200, uh, 2016 report, about 6,500 languages are surviving because these are spoken by only 4% of the world's population. And out of these, almost 4,000 are alive because of only 1% speakers are speaking them. And interestingly, 80% of the world's population communicates in 84 languages. Look, 6,500 languages, and there are only 84 languages spoken by, I mean, uh, which are spoken by 80% 80 per, 80 of the population. And half of the world's population speaks only 20, 20 languages. So this kind of situation. Here, I want to quote Ken Hell, uh, who is no more. He um, passed away a few years ago. He was a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's a very famous quote. I quote him. Uh, when you lose a language, you lose a culture, intellectual uh, wealth, a work of art. It's like dropping a bomb on the Louvre. So that is what he says. So this kind of importance is there uh, for our languages, but um, you know we really don't uh, take care of our languages uh, uh, in India and in other parts of the world also. Now I'll give you some data from India, uh, some uh, other important data. According to the 2011 census data, the total number of mother tongues, this is called rationalized mother tongues, not the raw data. After they decided, you know, how many mother tongues should, because uh, it's possible that a few people would say that they'd speak Bombaya. Bombaya cannot be a language. It, should, it has to be included under Marathi or Hindi, some other. That, that is how it is rationalized. Total number of mother tongues is 1,369. Out of this, 22 are scheduled languages. 99 are non scheduled languages, and the remaining are called mother tongues. If you, according to the uh, same you know, report, Census of India 2011 report, the percentage of speakers of these 22 scheduled languages, which are recognized by the Constitution of India, uh, is 96.71. But 
if you look at the remaining languages, which will be 1,347, <coughs> these include the mother tongues as well as the non civil languages, the percentage of speakers is only 3.29. So this kind of situation we have in our country. Uh, here, of course, I'll just very briefly mention Jim Cummins, who said that, you know, um, uh, you propose a very uh, significant uh, thing, he said, uh, uh, about uh, acquiring other languages or being uh, becoming a bilingual. He said that there is something called common underlying proficiency. That is the hypothesis is proposed way back in 81. And, uh, you know, it's because his argument was that if we know our mother tongue very well, acquiring another language, second language will be very easy because they share the same underlying proficiency. There isn't a common underlying proficiency. So his argument was that a strong mother tongue will lead to a strong other tongue. I have experiment, I cannot experiment on others. I did that experiment on my own children. And when I shifted to Hyderabad in 90, my kids were very young and uh, I got them admitted in an English medium school. And the teacher, English teacher who by then had gone to England for training, she called me after two, three months and told me, Dr. Mahanti, your uh, children cannot speak English. I said, I know that. Uh, she said, oh, you know that? Uh, okay. And now onwards, you should speak to them in English at home. But I never, never, never did that in my life. Because as a linguist, I know what I should do. And we spoke to those kids always in Odia. So that, you know, their mother tongue will be very strong. They cannot read and write Odia very fluently because they are brought up outside Odisha. But, you know, their uh, listening and uh, speaking uh, skills are very good. And I can tell you today, um, they speak better English than me, they speak better Telugu than me, they speak better Hindi than me, and their Odia is as good as mine. And I have advised, um, you know, many of my colleagues to do the same thing. So strong, if one is strong in the mother tongue, will definitely be strong in the other tongue. So if we emphasize mother tongue education, acquiring or learning another language will be very easy. And it's not another, learning another language is not a load. It is a pleasure. And uh, with reference to our national education policy, you know, where it is mentioned that the first five years of a child's life has to be uh, teaching, has to be in her mother tongue. Two years of preschool and three years of, you know, school years. And, uh, you know, this is uh, very important because uh, we must take care of uh, our children in their mother tongues. Of course, there is a problem here also. The government has to take care of that because we have one, as I mentioned to you, we have 1,369 mother tongues. And you must believe me, you know, whenever I give this, uh, whenever I asked in, uh, you know, webinars or conferences, uh, how many mother tongues are there in India, I have so far, I have never got a uh, you know, correct response from anybody. People don't know how many mother tongues are there in our country. Let's refer to the Census of India reports, 1,369 mother tongues. If there are 1,369 mother tongues, do, you, do we have the human resources to prepare teaching materials in all these mother tongues so that every child can be taught in her mother tongue for the past five years? It's not. So it is time India needs a policy, very you know, firm and strong language policy to conserve the extent rich diversity of languages that we have in this, in this country. And as I have mentioned earlier, if languages are conserved, the environment will be conserved. And if we do that, then there will be a promotion of these things and we can hope for a brighter and vibrant uh, future for India. Well, uh, since the theme of uh, uh, this uh, conference is hope, I would like, you know, I like this poem very much. And Emily Dickinson, um, Dickinson, an American poet, and she is no more. She passed away quite some time ago. And hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul 
and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept me, that kept so many words. I have heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity I asked, it asked a crumb of me. With this, I close. And uh, again, um, I should uh, say namaskar. The delivery that just happened, Professor Monty's delivery is an extremely important delivery because uh, Professor Monty's has touched on subjects uh, that draw from uh, ethnography to mathematics because the Benjamin Whorf hypothesis is actually for mathematics. And uh, he talks about Franz Boas, for example, where because of Franz Boas, the immigration policy in uh, the United States in the early 1900s itself had to become non-discriminatory um, because of cultural relativism that was propounded by Franz Boas, among so many other things that he has mentioned. It is absolutely phenomenal a talk, Professor Monti. We thank you for bringing in a diversity of intellectual ideas to the table. And I think it's important for design to, to mull over these and uh, for designers to do their own reading so that their over of understanding of what goes on behind the tool that we call typography is increased and that enriches uh, you know, the, the world at large. So uh, we have a question from Gargi Mukherjee. Gargi, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, professor. Hello, everyone. So um, not only a question, I actually had to contribute a lot of things to what he said. And I think it was very uh, valuable. Thank you, professor, for that. So uh, first thing is, professor, would you agree that um, a lot of our school, school books have this printing mistake, or I don't know how to communicate it exactly, that they communicate that Hindi is our national language? And that leads to a lot of uh, miscommunication in terms of that. So uh, a majority of the people in this country consider Hindi to be the national language and they focus only on uh, learning maybe just Hindi and English and maybe if they have a second, uh, like a third mother tongue. But they don't exactly pay the same respects to the other uh, uh, mother tongues or cultures maybe in terms of this. Would you agree with this? Well, I should tell you that uh, the publication division has published India 2020. Okay. It's almost 1,000 pages. It has a okay. 1,000-page book. Almost 1,000. 900, 900 something, 80, 70 kind of pages. There is no chapter on languages. Right. When we have right. so many languages and uh, diversity and everything, nothing. And our textbooks, school textbooks, don't talk about languages at all. Absolutely. I agree it is with time that. we, you know, it's unfortunate. You know, I have heard whatever you have said that Hindi is the national language. I have heard it from Gyanpit Hewadi authors. I have heard it from members of parliament time and again. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, and you know, it's we like a... need yes it's a, it's a common we need to sensitize that, we need yes. to sensitize that's yes. the only way exactly we'll have to tell people that india doesn't have a national national language, language. right india exactly. doesn't have a national religion no national language no national religion and it's not possible we'll also right that. i mean well, it's it's yeah. Well, yeah. logically not possible like if you uh, are saying that it's a multilinguistic country how can you mention that there's this, just this one language which is going to be lingua franca for the entire country right so uh, no people do say such things yeah yeah that was a significant uh, point to raise and we will pass on the baton to the next uh, member of the uh, you know, audience who wishes to ask a question sure uh, ma'am okay thank you very much Thank you for your question, Gargi. You can take this to Professor Monty in future, you know, at your own uh, pace because it requires a lot of discussion. But I now request the next person, Santosh. Right? Santosh, you have a question, right? Uh, Professor, what are your views about uh, you know, script sustains languages? That's what we feel. But what are your views about it? And especially our country has many scripts as well than the other countries. What are your views about it? Uh, well, 
um, we are human beings have definitely been speaking languages for more than 100,000 years. I, I'm sorry. Sorry, 100, yes, uh, uh, one lakh years, 100,000 years. Yes, definitely they have been speaking. But writing is hardly 5,000 years. And for your information, the Vedas were called Shruti some time ago. So that means, you know, it's not important uh, to conserve a language because of the scripts. Look at all our tribal languages. They have survived for millennia without a script. It is something, uh, and the whole of English doesn't have script of its own. It's Roman. Hindi doesn't have a script of its own. It's Devanagari, Nagari. So, you know, script I consider by, just like some kind of dress. You know, uh, look, Devanagari is being used by Hindi, uh, Marathi, Nepali, uh, Konkani, uh, Maithili, even Bodo, so many. So script is a different issue. If there is a language in a place, in a, um, a place and using a script, that's okay. All the Northeastern uh, languages, see their script is English, Roman, and it's hardly 200 years old, not before that. So script is important, not that yes, because unless there is education script, it's difficult to survive. But survival of language depends crucially on what happens at home. Today, in India, many parents are not speaking to their children in the mother tongue. I have the data. They are speaking, you know, some English, Hindi, something like that for other purposes. We need to sensitize them that this is not a, uh, you know, uh, uh, not a good thing. It's not the right way for at least a country like India. Um, thank you, Professor Monti. I would uh, go to Adarsh Malviya to please raise your question. Uh, thank you. So my question is in the lines of what Shirshagar sir asked. So when I say AC chal raha hai, uh, I would say it's Hindi. Just a one word uh, is of English. And if uh, the script doesn't make a language, and if a word and if words doesn't make a language, would you say uh, grammar is something that is unique to a, a particular language? or it's a combination of everything. I emphasized, I emphasized, you know, vocabulary words. I hmm. also hinted at that we don't, we have borrowed AC uh, from English, yes, but not, hmm. we never use I, you, or never use nose, I, you know, ear while speaking our languages. Have you ever heard somebody saying that um, you know, mere ear me dard ho raha hai, something like that. Never. So you know, there are certain words which are basic core for a language, and we don't. Uh, we never had an essay. We don't have a uh, uh, you know equivalent of, of essay. We don't have a, uh, an equivalent of bus car. So obviously, we have borrowed those things. There are different reasons to borrow. One is, let's say, need feeling motive, and the SE is a need feeling motive because we don't have a, a word in our language for that. So that's why we have borrowed. It's no more. It's no more English. Glass, gilas, or, or um, um, in Telugu, basu, or uh, you know, boss in Bangla and Odia. These are no more. It's not bus. It's not car. It's car. So, you know, when you borrow, they, we borrow, naturalize that. So that is how English is the richest language. English has taken so many words from India. And the most important, I will tell you, is mango. Mango is from uh, Dravidian languages. And for your information, Tamil, it's Mangai. And, you know, many words it has taken. So words are important. In fact, words are not emphasized in linguistics throughout the world today. There is no department of, almost no department of lexicography in this country. Words are important. I didn't say that a script is unimportant, no. But script is not the only, um, let's say, way to, uh, let's say, survive for a language's survival. Script is important, but you know, not a separate script for each language. 
and uh, i'll tell you why it is not more i have a friend in manipur and believe me he is uh, he is probably the best linguist of manipur but he is an illiterate person today because um, you know uh, the government decided that the earlier script should be abandoned then they introduce a new script which my friend didn't learn how to read and write so he has become illiterate all of a sudden overnight so script is important but there are issues which have to be you know uh, taken care of Uh, is there another uh, question we can take uh, i just wanted to add for uh, the participants in light of uh, the answers uh, given to us by professor mohanty that the reason for the initiative for us to join the global De unesco's global decade uh, of indigenous languages is to highlight the fact that communications uh is not expressed only through uh the literate type but also through uh pictorials a uh, pictograms and uh, just as professor monty said the cognitive revolution that was launched uh, 100000 years ago and launched all of these languages that we speak are actually driven by pictorials and the food unesco need to, wishes to bring to attention that our communication system needs to uh, include this and uh, if print was a harbinger of type uh, that is no longer important because uh, pictorials can also be printed and uh, uh, professor monty we expect that in the next decade by god's grace uh, as we take this initiative into the next decade we would seek your mentorship to uh, steer us into how we can marry oralities pictorials with a uh, a scripted typography uh, and take away the hegemony of typography uh, in terms of script and have people understand that a more inclusive system of typography would be something that also brings in com the communication systems that do not necessarily use the script yeah thank you yeah i'll be, i'll love to you know be a part of that yes thank you very much thank you professor monty for keeping time for being so uh, spirited in your answers uh, you you means no words and uh, your wide scholarship has brought a fantastic amount of understanding a new understanding to what uh, typography uh, should do in future we expect that you will stay with us on this stay the course with us on this in the next few years and we will seek your advice and we thank you profusely for such a wonderful presentation uh, that I, because your knowledge of all this is so wide and yet you were able to encapsulate it in a few slides that made it easy for our audience to understand and uh, you know keep their wits and still be able to ask you questions so on that note professor monty we want to again thank you for taking the time out to address the session and uh, we uh, thank the audience for being uh, uh, so lively and spirited and for asking your wonderful questions uh, santosh's question about script uh, will uh, will will yeah. be trail blazing in terms of future discussions now uh, as also the other questions and santosh we encourage you to always ask questions like that uh santosh being a great typographer and a calligrapher uh, so uh, only because of lack of time we move on to the next uh, platform and i pass on the floor to shweta to please uh, steer the session thank you professor mohan thank you namaskar namaskar uh, i know thank you everybody and namaskar namaskar over to shweta shweta thank you dr ajanta sen for chairing this session and also thank you to professor mohanty for your presentation we now move on to the next session of the conference the parallel workshop sessions so to attend our parallel workshop sessions press on the breakout room button the one with the four squares at the bottom of your screen and join the session of your choice we also have a meeting room that you can use to chat with others during the conference we also have a room to a room for help and support in case you need one we wish you the very best and do contact us for any clarifications you can now move on to the parallel workshop sessions starting at uh, indian standard time 2 to 3:30 pm thank you